Good morning. Let's try that once more. Good morning. Good morning. Much better. Uh, my name is David Lose. I hold the Marbury Anderson Chair in Biblical Preaching, which means a couple things. One, it means I get to participate in the planning of this event each year. It's one of the highlights of my year, and I think you'd agree we're off to a good start. I uh, also means I teach here at Luther Seminary with excellent colleagues and fabulous students every day. And uh, as you can tell, I love my work. Um, I'd like to introduce our president, uh, Rick Blees, to welcome you. Rick joined the Luther Seminary faculty as academic dean and associate professor of mission in July 2003. Floundering in that position, he was elected president of the seminary. <laughs> No, he was then elected president of the seminary in 2005. Uh, Rick has variously served as a pastor, a mission developer, missionary, professor. At heart, however, if you know him, you know this to be true, he is an evangelist with a heart and passion for proclaiming the gospel in this 21st century world of many faiths and cultures. And therefore, he knows and values how incredibly important biblical preaching is in this day and age. Rick, thank you for being here to welcome all of our guests to, and to formally launch the second annual celebration of biblical preaching. Rick, please. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm still sitting at the foot of the cross with, uh, with your sermon this morning. How inspiring and uh, it's just moving, and so we thank you for getting us off to a great start. Uh, I want to welcome you here officially on behalf of the whole Luther Seminary community. This is a special time. Uh, those who were here last year know uh, what to expect, and my expectations are high. In fact, last year I sat in the back to begin with, and I kept calling my administrative assistant and said, cancel an appointment, <laughs> cancel my appointment. Uh, because I was being fed and inspired and taught in areas that are just so important for all of us. And so these are important moments, hours, and days together. Uh, we have lifted up this conference in prayer. There's been a lot of planning, but also a lot of spiritual work undergirding this in prayer that the Spirit would indeed bless us together as we're inspired by the word. I hope that you would spend time not only in your sessions but uh, together. What we found is some fascinating people, talented people, uh, come together for these events and I hope that you'll take the time during breaks or in sessions or over food just to get to know who is here. You will also be inspired by the people who are sitting right next to you. And finally, not only I hope you have a high expectation, but a sense of urgency. When we're in our congregations, what we see happening in our churches, or when we visit our people, we do realize it is a matter of life and death. The theme is so appropriate. And so our prayer is during this time that God will speak a word of life into all of us. Blessings, thanks for being here, welcome. Whatever we can do to make this time a blessing for you, just let us know. Again, welcome. An ordained minister of the United Church of Canada, Paul Scott Wilson currently serves as professor of homiletics at Emmanuel College of the University of Toronto. Paul has served as president of the Academy of Homiletics and received the United Church of Canada's Davidson Trust Award for excellence in teaching and scholarship. A prolific author, Paul has written on almost every dimension of preaching always to the health and edification of the preachers of this world. And for good reason is the general editor of Abingdon's The New Interpreter's Handbook of Preaching that was recently selected by Preaching Magazine as the 2010 Preaching Book of the Year. Beyond all that, Paul is just a marvelous human being and a steady and constant witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He lectures widely in Canada and the United States, and in just a moment, you'll understand why. Please join me in welcoming Paul Scott Wilson. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. 
What a treat it is for me to be here among you uh, celebrating this wonderful vocation that we have. I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in Canada. And you know, there's a border that lies between this space and the northern space of Canada. And it's surprising how much attention we give to that kind of border. We need a certain kind of passport to cross it. But you know, there's only one passport that really matters, and it's the passport that's on each of our foreheads. And that should be our first allegiance. And these other boundaries should be uh, as, though, as though not, Paul says, as though not. Well, that's an exciting topic that we have for this. I, I was invited to address the, the only instructions I was given were make some kind of address on biblical preaching as a, a matter of life and death. And the whole thing was open. And... So I'd, I've chosen something as, as the title for my address, something that might seem to be contradictory to our notion of biblical preaching, and that is going beyond the text to revitalize biblical preaching. Now, if someone were to ask folks on the street, what exactly are matters of life and death people would probably say something like murder, war, cancer. They probably wouldn't include preaching. <laughs> Comedian Will Schreiner had that line, I want to die in my sleep like my grandfather, not screaming and yelling like the passengers in his car. <laughs> now, when he wrote that, he was talking about car accidents. He wasn't talking about preaching. And, and there's a reason, because most people don't tend to think of preaching as a life and death matter. So what are we doing here? You, you knew what the title was when you came here. Are we trying to persuade ourselves that, that what we do really is important in spite of what the world says? Or is there some relevance to the audacious idea that biblical preaching is an urgent matter, even of life and death? Today I want to start by, by naming some ways, seven ways in which I think that biblical preaching may be a matter of life and death. And then I want to move to explore some ways in which biblical preaching today may fall short of these descriptions. And finally, I want to move to some suggestions for remedy. So, seven ways in which biblical preaching is a matter of life and death. The first one, biblical preaching is a matter of life and death because it is concerned with the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Each of the gospel writers retraces this story. Paul reflects on it. The Apostles' Creed summarizes it. Scholars argue it. The church celebrates it. The hymns sing it. The stained glass windows picture it. The video screen makes points of it. The Lord's Supper enacts it. The sermons proclaim it. So to the extent that preaching is about Jesus Christ, it is a matter of life and death. Biblical preaching is a matter of life and death because it is concerned with salvation. Elizabeth Actemeyer, many years ago, wrote, urged preachers to be very clear in what they said because she said, the eternal life or death of the hearers may depend on their knowing what we mean. So she understood that someone's life might hang in the balance every time we preach. Someone may be just needing that moment of hope, that word of possibility. 
Number three, biblical preaching is a matter of life and death because it is concerned with putting to death the old creation and announcing the new. Paul spoke of creation subjected to futility, the whole creation groaning in labor pains until now. And he says that even now the Spirit helps us in our weakness, and God makes all things, all things work together for good for those who love God. Number four, biblical preaching speaks the gospel to all the changing seasons of life. When I read the obituary pages, I'm convinced that more and more people are are dying. It's a growing movement. (laughs) And yet, more and more people are are being born as well. It's to all of those moments as well as all of those in between that preaching speaks. So it's a matter of life and death. Number five, biblical preaching is a matter of life and death because it's not about me. It's not about me. Paul said it in different words in Galatians 2. He said, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's a good understanding of our vocation when we are preaching. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Or if we took the words of John the Baptist, about what could be words about the faithful preacher, when he sees the Lamb, he says he rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice and says, He must increase, and I must decrease. Every time we preach, those words are true for us. It's a matter of ourselves dying to self. Number six, biblical preaching is a matter of life and death because in spite of our best efforts, fewer people seem to be coming to know Jesus Christ. And the church, as we know it, may be in serious decline. And this seems almost contradictory to our calling. Membership in mainline denominations is down, and even in Korea where there was such an explosion of church growth, there has been a decline of roughly 10% in each of the last two decades. And number seven, biblical preaching is a matter of life and death because in many quarters there is a lack of clarity about the relationship of what we preach to the gospel. And I want to explore that. I want to explore the life and death issue of exegesis as we move into this next portion. Biblical preaching has remained centered on the rough formula. Say what the biblical text says, and then say what it means. It's exegesis application. Biblical preaching relies on good exegesis and hermeneutics, on historical and other kinds of criticism, reading texts in scholarly ways according to the traditions of the church. It was only a hundred years ago that Adolf Ulicker said of parables that parables have one meaning. And that was echoed as recently as 1967 in, in that... Um, book by Otto Kaiser and Werner Kummel, Exegetical Method, a Student's Handbook, 1967, said there was an objective meaning of every text. Well, we've moved a long way from there. And now, what was a big issue then is, is 
a smaller issue today. Back then, the big issue seemed to be the distinction between exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis draws meaning from a text, and eisegesis reads something into a text as a way of distortion. Today, an objective reading of a text is not possible because we understand that every text is read from a different perspective. Interpretation is a matter of perspective, culture, and experience. Contextual analysis is needed both of the text itself and of the reader. As preachers, we pay attention both to to what the texts say, and exegesis often leads us to what the texts do not say. One of Gary Larson's cartoons is, you've seen it, it's of two mosquitoes and one is is biting someone's arm and has bulging eyes of alarm and its body seems about to explode, and the other mosquito is shouting, Betty, Betty, pull out, you've hit an artery. (laughs) Sometimes it's that way with students with exegesis. (laughs) Because before they do their exegetical assignments, they'd look at the text and they say, oh, why did I get this text assigned to me? I've got nothing to say about it. And then they do their exegetical homework, and they, they're still lamenting. Oh, now I've got too much to say. How can I narrow this down to a sermon? It's a common dilemma. But what we need to be able to do is, is to find some path, some focus, some way to the pulpit path that reconstructs the biblical text, and engages it with the Christian faith. And this is where I think in some places, maybe not here, but in some places this is probably a key issue for preaching today. What is the relationship between the exegesis one does for a text or the help one gets indeed from many of the biblical commentaries, especially those designed for lectionary, What's the relationship between this particular text and the larger gospel that we proclaim? Here's the issue. If you reduced the number, if you reduced the New Testament, or indeed the Old Testament as well, to the number of texts that contain the gospel, that explicate it, that make it plain, you would have a very thin book. The number of texts that actually speak to what is the gospel. It's, we understand, at least I understand, the gospel to be God's saving acts, God's acts of redemption, particularly seen in Jesus Christ, who came to us in human form, who ministered among us and worked mighty miracles, who died on the cross, rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven and reigns with God eternally, and... At the end of time, he will come again and all of God's promises will be fulfilled. How many texts actually say that? How many texts actually make plain the identity of who Jesus is? Because if we preach a text and we preach about Jesus... Jesus is working this miracle or that miracle or is teaching us this truth. Why should that make any difference to us if we don't know who he is? If you've just come into church and you've not been exposed to the Christian faith before and the minister speaks about Jesus doing these things, what's to distinguish Jesus from a superhero in a comic book? If we don't get to the identity of Jesus, then we can't get to the identity of the gospel. Isn't there some need for us to find a way in the preaching path, on the way to the pulpit, to engage the gospel? 
I mean, we heard it done this morning so powerfully and wonderfully by Michael. He repeatedly moved outside of his text. And yet, in another way, he never left his text. But the gospel was engaged in the proclamation of the word. So that's the dilemma that, I'm, that I see. I don't know how you would see it. Maybe it isn't a problem in terms of, of your own perspective. But for me, that's a key issue for us. How do we... We're so faithful to biblical texts when we do our exegesis, and we've been taught to stay within the pericope, and we've, my, myself, I was encouraged in my own teaching uh, when I was taught, I was encouraged once I have dealt faithfully with the biblical text, I can sit down. My work is done. And I'm wanting to suggest, at least today, for us, that our work isn't done when we've finished with the text, Unless we've got to the gospel, we're still falling short. Now, our notion of text, it's helpful to remember, is a recent notion of text. When we speak of a text, we speak of a a unit, a pericope of Scripture, something that had its own integrity, if it ever existed separately from the, the canon, and when it was brought in, it still has something of that identity. You don't want to take just a a verse of Scripture and read it out of context. We want to see it within its, its distinctive pattern. Uh, and I want us to honor that because the shape of a text affects its meaning. Its origin is important. So I'm not suggesting in this that we do something different than we have been doing in terms of exegetical work, rather that we do something more. Biblical preaching, I would say, is life to the extent that it seeks God's words, God's word in particular biblical texts, and links those texts to the faith of the church. And biblical preaching is deaf to the degree that it may be exegetically sound and yet ignore God and fail to transmit the faith the good news of the gospel. So, four ways of going beyond the text to revitalize biblical preaching. Uh, So what's in and what is outside of a text? I believe that thinking of texts as relatively independent units needs to be balanced with an understanding that biblical texts exist for the church not just to record or transmit history, but to feed faith. We need to expand our idea of text to include the theological concerns that have resided in those texts and that held them together in the first place. Part of that is the historical context of the texts, the faith setting, So, the first way that we might make biblical preaching more biblical is to make God's action the primary focus of the sermon. Ask of the biblical text, what is God doing in or behind this text? Let that be your first question. Because if the text is not saying something about God and consequently about us, If it's not saying something about God, then it is not yet functioning as Scripture. Make a sentence that focuses on God. Let that be your theme sentence. Because chances are, if your theme sentence doesn't have God in it, your sermon is not going to have God in it in a significant way. That's just how theme sentences work. But if you start with a focus on God, then you have a a greater likelihood of landing where you need to land. And it's surprising, you know, how much resistance there can be to finding God in a biblical text. 
I, I, was, I was totally surprised. I had asked a constructive theologian at, at one of the top universities to write a passage reflecting on the theological significance of, one of the, the gospel reading for Easter with specific focus on God. That was, that was the instruction. And what came back was a piece reflecting on how we need to witness. I thought it might have something to do with God raised Jesus from the dead. But the focus was we need to witness. There's resistance even to the, the most obvious kinds of texts that would seem to proclaim the gospel. And I'm not sure what that resistance is about. But it's part of our deconstructive age and part of the seeming dying of the church. But we always need to be careful when we use a phrase like that because the church is always belonging to Jesus Christ. And it's not up to us to save the church. But you know, I had a professor of, uh, of homiletics who made a good comment once. We had a student who, was, uh, who came to class to do the assigned sermon for a particular grade. It was half the, half the mark of the whole course. And this student came to class, stood up in the pulpit, and uh, kind of wandered around a bit, and afterwards the, the professor said, well, didn't you prepare a sermon? And he said, no, I didn't think I should. And he said, well, didn't you do any exegesis? And he said, no. He said, I think that exegesis means exit Jesus. And I thought that was witty. He, he, he failed to recognize that the Holy Spirit works through scholarship and study. But then, then this professor said something that I've remembered all these years. He said, when, when Jesus was tempted to throw himself off the parapet and let the angels lift him up, he refused that temptation. And when you go in the pulpit, so should you. <laughs> John Buchanan wrote beautifully in the Christian Century on how his Presbyterian denomination now welcomes children to the Lord's table. Confirmation, he said, is no longer on the basis of what one knows about Jesus, the Trinity, the doctrines of justification, redemption, and sanctification. And this is what he wrote back in June. He said, I thought about all of that as I laid my hands on the heads of members of this year's confirmation class, particularly when I came to my granddaughter, Rachel. I don't think Rachel could have memorized enough of the catechism to pass the test in the old days. Rachel has Down syndrome and is part of a group of young persons who talked a lot together during the year, served meals to the homeless, stayed overnight in a homeless shelter, and experienced church as a place of service and celebration in Jesus' name. They each wrote a statement of faith and experienced church as a place of service and celebration in Jesus' name. Rachel wrote, Jesus means church for me. Church is faith. I feel church all the time. I go to church to learn about God, to worship and to be thankful for Jesus. Well, preaching needs to communicate God, but 
it is important that we not think too narrowly about how God is communicated. Teaching doctrine is not the only way. The stories we tell, the examples we use, our tone and gesture, our practical living, the ecclesial mission of the church, all of these shape the understanding that we communicate through our preaching of who God is. But God needs to be the focus of the sermon. And we need to find God in the text if we're going to be truly biblical in our preaching. Second, conceive of the structure of the sermon as flowing from law to gospel, or what I call trouble to grace, or from exodus to the promised land, or from crucifixion to resurrection. Some will say that this imposes a grid on the biblical text. I was at Calvin Seminary. There was a good discussion of this issue because they have moved to uh, teaching preaching that follows something of law to gospel. But there was a debate about this in the, in, in the public sphere, and um, someone had stood up and said, well, this, this seems to impose a grid on the text. And the Old Testament professor, I was rather interested, the Old Testament professor stood up and, and said, well, you know, as Christians, he said, we understand that Scripture for the church is revelatory of God's salvation. To the degree that it is revelatory, he said, it indicates to us what must change. And to the degree that it is saving, it casts us on God's grace. So he was suggesting that this is this pattern of moving from law to gospel in the sermon is not a grid imposed on the text, but one invited by the faith of the church. Now, when Calvinists start to think like Lutherans, <laughs> something's happening. But I know that there's this temptation, too, for us to to follow what has been common, for instance, with Luther. Luther. Luther would never have said that the sermon should move from law to gospel. That was rather the way of theology. That's how one reflected. One, there were those two different modes, and one could easily in the sermon move back and forth. And chances are, in Luther's age, when sermons were 40 minutes, and when people were steeped in the Bible, Perhaps people still got a sense of what was law and what was gospel through hearing that kind of interchange. But today, when there are pressures on the time, if we fluctuate back and forth between law and gospel in the sermon, my fear is that people will not experience either. The gospel is not just knowledge that is presented. It's an experience that must be communicated. It's a relationship that must be lived. So if the law never comes on us with a, a full bind, if, if we start developing the law and then move into the gospel and then move back to the law, it's kind of like swinging back and forth on a swing. We wear people out with the, and the hinge soon gives way. Rather, what we should be doing is, is allowing the law in the text to build, to put its bite into us so that we begin to feel uncomfortable. We begin to be hungry for the gospel. We recognize this isn't something that, that, that the preacher has fabricated, a hunger that we didn't have. Rather, the preacher, in touching us with the word of the law, has named the brokenness that we are experiencing has identified that we are indeed thirsty. And in that thirst and hunger, we are able then to turn to the gospel and receive it and be fed and drink deeply. When, we, when the sermon moves from law to gospel, and I would say roughly half and half, 
so that there's actual substance to the good news, then what we're doing is we're mirroring the movement of faith. We send people out, yes, 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 we send them out with a burden. There are things for them to do. There is mission to be accomplished. There are tasks to be done because we reach out to the world and, and we are to be broken. But that isn't the gospel. The gospel is that we have one who goes before us, who sends the Spirit to accompany us and empower us. This isn't ideas we're taking out to the world. This is the power of the new creation. We go out and do what we do in Christ's name, and he has gone ahead of us, and he is accomplishing it. And you know, one of the amazing things about this message that we have is that it is so eschatological. It has so much to do with the future. There is God's future is going to be accomplished. It's not a matter of, of whether it will be or not. It's going to be accomplished. It's a matter of whether we join in that accomplishment or not. When we, when, when we experience the gospel in that kind of way, it isn't a heavy burden that we are carrying. Rather, the burden is light. And we're excited. We're enthusiastic about going out to that place of need because precisely where we do not have the equipment or the energy or the love or the forgiveness or the compassion for the poor or the time to give to the needy, precisely in those places when our resources are gone, we discover that we are lifted up with resources that are not our own. And our faith is renewed in the doing. So, let me give an example of what a sermon might be structured like if, if we were to think of the sermon flowing from, from law to gospel. With, for instance, an obvious text like um, the Good Shepherd in John 10, I would start early in the week by identifying a theme sentence that has to do with God, and I would feel confident in doing that partly because many of the commentaries aren't going to get there. So if, if I start there, that, that gives me a good grounding. And so I would say, well, what's the theme sentence of, of this? And I would probably choose as my theme sentence that Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. It's fairly obvious, not very difficult, doesn't have to be difficult. I think of the sermon not only in two halves, but also in, in four pages. The first half is, is what has often been done as a kind of bread and butter sermon throughout the ages, where you do your exegesis of the text, you deal with the text, and then you have an application. And that's a, a good, solid model for preaching it. It roots what we are saying in the Word of God, and then we apply that Word. But if we only go once to the biblical text, chances are the word that we're going to come out with is a word of law. So I think of the first two pages as law in the biblical text and applying it, law in our world. And that's good as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. When I grew up, most of the sermons that I heard were exactly that, and they had a little bit of gospel attached to the end. It was pointing to the cross. It said, but Jesus Christ died for you, therefore go out into the world in hope. But there was never any building up of that hope, never de any development. I could never know where I might expect to see God doing any of anything. That's why we need a second half. We need to go back into the text and, and look for grace in the biblical text. And that is where that sentence will be developed. That's where the theme sentence will, will receive an in-depth treatment. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. And then a page four would, would follow an application of that. So here are the pages. Page one would be uh, kind of the inverse of, of the theme sentence. If the theme sentence is Jesus Christ is the good shepherd, page one, dealing with trouble in the text, is going to 
perhaps be, many people follow false shepherds. That's what Jesus is implying. Many people follow false shepherds. Page two, applying that word of law to our own world, trouble in our world or law in our world, many people choose death. There's no number of instances that we can point to in the world around us that indicate people choosing death. They, oh, they don't think it's death. They, they, it looks like life, and that's one of the things about evil, isn't it? It always looks good. Good and bad, those are, those are easy to discern. Evil is the hard thing because it always disguises itself to look good. So page three, then, would be Jesus Christ is the good shepherd, and page four would be Christ gives us life, or Christ shepherds us, or however you want to phrase it. But, but what's, what's helpful about that is it kind of gives a basic structure early on in the week. If you start with that theme sentence and then do the flip side and see what the law is in the text, you, you end up with having four discrete units of your, your sermon and an easy pattern to fill in. If someone t says, tell me a joke, if you're like me, your mind goes blank. And it's the same way, give me a sermon. But if I start to think about four parts of a sermon, then it, it becomes much more possible. And es especially, each is a discrete task, roughly a quarter of the sermon. The, the nice thing about this, too, if you start with page three and then flip it to page one, you've got two halves that fit together. It isn't two separate sermons. They hold together as a unit, and that's powerful. So the third suggestion I have for biblical preaching is proclaim the gospel. Now, that would seem fairly obvious. But sometime before the sermon ends, proclaim the gospel. <laughs> now, this, this is a bold and daring act. And it's speaking on behalf of God. It's, you know, some preachers, you know, I think, I think Fred Craddock has given us many gifts, many wonderful gifts, particularly in being able to reclaim narrative for the pulpit. He wasn't the only one, but he, he spoke about as one without authority. And it's a very daring thing, though, to speak for God, to say the words of liberation to the people that God wants them to hear as spoken by God to them. That's a daring act. It's, it's saying words like, I love you. I forgive you. I will never let you go. You are mine. My peace I give to you. It's, it's words of liberation and freedom. My justice is yours. It's, it's a daring thing, and some people in these days would say, well, you know, we, that's too much authority for the preacher to take. And yet, every time we stand in the pulpit, particularly in a section of the service that is often called the Word of God, people are expecting that in some way we are speaking the Word of God, so why not speak for God? Why not actually make that as a, as a step in the preaching where we do the gospel to the people? That was Gerhard Ferde's thesis. Some of you, how many of you studied with Gerhard Ferde? So this is, this understanding of proclamation is not a new understanding for you. Proclamation offers intimate words, supportive words, words that typically, this is important, make clear the identity of the risen one. Who is it who dares to speak this way? I give you life. 
if it is not the one who has risen from the dead. The identity of the risen one is part of the gospel. All of the way through history, one can find both teaching and proclamation in sermons. And I think that that's kind of a helpful distinction, thinking of teaching and proclamation. We teach about many things. We teach about the Bible. We teach about theology. We teach about the traditions of the church. We teach about uh, mission, uh, ethics, a variety of things, all important. And, in fact, without good teaching, there can be no proclamation. Proclamation needs a manger to lie in. Emil Brunner, in the 1930s, spoke of proclamation. He says, in itself, it is something other than doctrine. It is faith awakening, faith furthering, faith wooing address. That's, that's lovely. It, it's, it's romance language. It's faith awakening, faith furthering, faith wooing address. Proclamation, he says, means an event entirely personal in the nature of a personal meeting. In this meeting, God in Christ and through the Holy Spirit speaks directly to us in a variety of ways, saying the words that are at the heart of the gospel. So your text is leading you to some place where God is speaking, what words? And don't think that there's, on, there's a shortage of words about this. God has so many ways to say, I love you. And every text gives us a different kind of perspective on what those words might be. But we don't have to stop with where the text stops. We can bring in any of the words. The, what, what we had demonstrated so beautifully by Michael this morning was, was an intertextuality, a freedom to move from text to text and bring in whatever text might help to reinforce the authentic word found in the text itself. And so the Holy Spirit speaks directly to us in a variety of ways, saying words that are at the heart of the gospel, I wipe away all tears from your eyes. I redeem you. You can go nowhere where I can't find you. I go ahead of you. Well, I, think, I like to think that when we move to, to that place in our preaching where we're doing the gospel to the people or doing the word to the people, doing the text to the people, that we have arrived at a place that we are called to arrive at every time we preach the text. Teaching and proclamation overlap, and I just want to say a couple of words about that to try and make the, the distinction, because the border between teaching and proclamation is porous. Even in excellent teaching, proclamation can be heard. Uh, and in proclamation, there is some teaching. But to try and separate them out a little bit, teaching is informational in purpose. It's informational, whereas proclamation is transformational. The gospel comes to the people as a summons of good news. Jesus says, I died for you, for you, for you. Teaching focuses on what people are to do and think and believe. With proclamation, what God does now is highlighted. The blind, as Luke says, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Teaching talks about various topics and generally falls short of doing the word. It's about rather than doing. With proclamation, listeners are introduced to God and cast on divine resources 
powers and promises. And the final distinction with teaching and proclamation, teaching points to God, but it generally leaves one in the old creation. Saying with Mary and Martha, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. With proclamation, we say in effect with what Mary and Martha said in the new creation, Lord, because you are here, my brother is alive. So we don't need to let the sermon end where the story of the miracle has been retold, but rather when it has been performed. Introduce listeners to the one who is the author of the miracle, not just then, but now. He is the one who became flesh that we might know who God is, who ministered among us and performed miracles and spoke truth, who died on the cross and rose again and who ascended to heaven, whose spirit is with us now, ministering among us and performing those same miracles. Every time we preach, a miracle takes place. I define a miracle rather broadly, any action of God any action of God. Every sermon is an action of God. Every sermon is a miracle. You might remind yourself that. <laughs> it's not just you. My final suggestion for renewing biblical preaching may be surprising, and it is this. Allow allegory to enhance biblical preaching. Now, we've all been brought up in the same school that teaches us that allegory is to be avoided. To allegorize is dangerous, particularly when reading a biblical text that is not an allegory. It makes, allegory makes texts say what they do not say. So, for instance, with the parable of the, the ten maidens, to allegorize would be to say that the bridegroom equals Jesus, his delay equals the overdue second coming, the wedding equals the kingdom or realm of God, the shut door equals the last judgment, the wise maidens equal the true believers, and the foolish maidens equal the backsliders, and so forth. That's bad allegory. I recommend al that allegory be recovered, but in a very limited way, not as a way of interpreting biblical texts on pages one and three, but rather as a way of applying biblical texts to today. Think of it not as interpretation, but application, using the imagery and the wording of the text to extend beyond the text to the faith life of the people here. For example, look beyond the text to see, well, use the text as, as, as a vantage point. I, I tend to think of different texts as being like uh, viewpoints on a mountain. And every place you have a viewpoint, you get a different view but always on the horizon with preaching. Every viewpoint, every text that you stand on gives you a different view of the cross and resurrection. So look toward the cross and resurrection and see what is different. So for instance, in the call of Isaiah, we often romanticize that text, the call of Isaiah, um, and, and we fantasize that, that we too are, are like Isaiah. Um, I, I, we aren't. But in, in the call of Isaiah, the angel says, now that this coal has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. 
Now, if you preached that text to me and you sat down afterwards, I would say, well, what reason do I have to believe that that connects with me in any way? Isaiah was Isaiah. He had his own specific call in his own specific time. He had visions I don't have. An angel came to him in his vision and, and said those words, but what are they to me? But if you take that text and stand on it and look toward the cross and resurrection, don't we, don't we hear something, an, an echo we've heard before? Didn't Jesus on the cross say words, those same words to us? Your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Isn't now, isn't now Isaiah's story my story? But until I've got to the cross and resurrection, until I've heard Christ say those words to me, they are not words said to me. They are not words at the foundation of my faith because my faith springs from that place at the foot of the cross and from the identity of the, the one God who is Isaiah's God and my God. Let me give you a, 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 one more example from the story of Zacchaeus, because as we know, Zacchaeus is... He, he, the text says that he climbed up in the tree so that he would be able to see who Jesus was. He had heard about Jesus. So this is, is roughly what I would do with, with that text in a sermon as, as a way... Like this proclamation can be a, more... It doesn't have to be just in a few lines. You can develop it a little bit, uh, this, this way of, of um, using the allegory of the text, the details of the text to expand to the larger Christian story. So we've been talking, this is, this is me in the sermon somewhere toward the end. We've been talking about Zacchaeus climbing up a tree, as the text says, to see who Jesus is. No man of wealth or dignity would climb up a tree in those days. But Zacchaeus was short of stature in more ways than one. He came up short in the eyes of his neighbors. By climbing up in that sycamore tree, he could see Jesus. He could see the one who would call his name without ever having met him. He could see the one who would invite himself to his house. He could see the one who would make him want to make amends to his neighbors. There in full view was one who would make him want to give away half of his goods to the poor and restore any ill-gotten wealth to its owners. Up there he could see the one who would bring salvation to his home. Now here's where I extend it. No matter how high in that tree Zacchaeus climbed, he would not be able to see the hill outside Jerusalem nor the tree upon that hill that Jesus would climb. He climbed up it so that not only Zacchaeus, but the whole world would be able to see who he is. Jesus says to us from the cross, if you want to see who I am, look here. I climbed this tree so that you would not have to. I love you and I die your death for you. From that cross, he says to us, I must stay at your house today. Your wrongs, I give you the power to right. Your quarrels, I give you the power to resolve. Your relationships, I mend. Your tears, I wipe away. Your poor, I tend to. Your blindness, I heal. Your deafness, I unstop. Your loneliness, I visit. Your hunger, I feed. Today, I bring salvation to your house. That's allegory. In recommending this use of allegory to make preaching more biblical, I invite preachers to use their, your own texts. As, think of it as being kind of like a Christmas tree. Think of, think of your text as a Christmas tree on which you hang the ornaments of faith. But these ornaments are no mere ornaments. They are, in fact, what it's all about. It's the gospel. 
if you want to. Paul, thank you for taking this task of biblical preaching and our calling to that so seriously and bringing your scholarship and your insight and your counsel to bear to the health and edification of those gathered here and to those we serve at home.